This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, for those who have not met me, uh, my name is Roger Kane. I'm the Dean and Chief Executive of the uh, School of Advanced Study here at the University of London. Uh, we are an institution uh, which supports and facilitates and promotes uh, research in the humanities and social sciences in London, across the UK and, and out uh, to the rest of the world. Tonight we're here uh, to listen to the academic year 2011-12 uh, visiting fellow lecture, which has been made possible by a very generous endowment uh, to the School of Advanced Study uh, by the Singapore businessman and philanthropist uh, Sen T. Lee. We use his endowment to bring a researcher of international stature to the UK to meet us, to talk with us, to debate with us uh, here in London and to engage with like-minded academics across the UK. Uh, tonight's speaker uh, goes on uh, to Cambridge, Edinburgh and Bristol. Now the process by which uh, the visiting fellow is selected is by the directors of the ten institutes which make up the School of Advanced Study. Uh, this year, uh, the visiting fellow, Professor Stephen Shapin of Harvard University, uh, was nominated by Barry Smith, uh, director of our Institute of Philosophy, uh, and was unanimously supported by myself and by uh, Barry's uh, colleagues. And Barry will say a little bit more about uh, Stephen in a moment when he takes the chair for the lecture uh, and the subsequent uh, tasting event which uh, he and Stephen have organized. But let me just say that Stephen Chapin is an academic who genuinely can be said to bestride the world stage. A person that we and STB are honoured to have associated with the School of Advanced Study. So, the chairing of tonight then is a two-handed affair. And I'll now pass over to Professor Barry Smith, Director of the Institute of Philosophy and Associate Dean of the School. Barry. It's a great pleasure to welcome Stephen Shapen to join us and also to give the S.T. Lee uh, Visiting Professor of Fellow Lecture. Many of you, I think, tonight are in the audience because you already know of Stephen's work, which spans an enormous amount of uh, detailed uh, and thoughtful discussion of the history of science, the way science is pursued, the way industrial relations uh, between scientists inside academies and outside academies have been conducted in the 19th and 20th century. His work has ranged over a, a very large set of issues, but always with the same forensic detail, and always with the same attention to not just the science and the scientific findings, but the methods that scientists use, the way their ideas are tracked and pursued, and the community and history of those ideas. And it's a great delight to see that he has been increasingly turning his attention to the subject of taste. Now, taste was for a very long time one of the, uh, the most neglected of the senses, one of the poor relations, always uh, overshadowed by vision and audition as being uh, intellectual senses which could raise our eyes and our ears and attend to things independent of ourselves. But many, many academics now, and certainly in the uh, natural sciences and neurosciences, psychology, and indeed in cultural anthropology, have been discovering just how complex and how articulate our notion of taste and tasting is. Taste is one of the first experiences we have. Taste, and our sense of taste, is a gatekeeper to everything that enters uh, the body from the environment to nourish us. And it's a very important sense which develops a preference, a liking, a disliking for things. From that early sense of our 
engagement with taste, we become discriminating and discerning. And it's often something that we take for granted, that that just comes from our own individual experience. But of course, Stephen Shapen has done a lot of research into the history of our sense of taste and the cultural factors which have, and practices, and indeed scientific uh, endeavors to calculate and measure taste, which have shaped and given some extra dimension to the experiences that we think of as just perhaps subjective and individual. And it's a great pleasure to have somebody research this area and bring to light some of the historical roots as well as the contemporary uh, discussions of taste that are going on at pace in the natural sciences. So I think we need the cultural dimension, I think we need the, uh, the historical dimension, and for that reason we're very lucky to have Stephen addressing these issues tonight. And after the theoretical discussion, for those of you who have registered, there will be a tasting which I will be uh, leading uh, just across the hall, in the Magdalene Hall opposite. So if your name is down on the list, we know that you're coming. If it's not, I'm afraid we had to cap the numbers just so that we could contain enough glasses and tables and, and people to, to do the tasting. But first, let's wait our appetite properly with the serious intellectual business of the evening. And would you join me in welcoming Stephen Chin? Tremendous pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks so much. I want to thank Dean Kane, Barry Smith, Sarah Allen, uh, Peter Niven for getting me here. Unfortunately, none of them could get me through Heathrow passport control. <laughs> there was a time when I wondered whether I actually arrive here in time. <laughs> um, that's the usual starting slide that we have these days, but that's also my subject. That's the title on the right, and that's my subject on the left. That's a uh, a genre painting from the 1670s by a man called Gottfried Schalken that's not of great importance. But this is one of the few images we have, not of the, the genre of the five senses, of which there are many, uh, but of the act of tasting. This is a, a girl who is about to taste uh, an apple. Schalken did quite a number of these sorts of things. And if you look at that uh, scene, there are, there are quite a few natural facts, as it were, involved in that scene. One can hypothesize with some confidence that the apple that she's about to eat is chemically roughly the same, may have tasted better, may not have tasted better, but roughly chemically the same as apples now are. One can also hypothesize with great confidence that the neurophysiological processes that uh, she will undergo when she puts the apple uh, on her tongue are roughly the same as the neurophysiological processes that happen now. But there's also deep historicity in that scene. A series of questions which are historical nature. What's in her head as she puts that apple in her mouth? What does she think that food is uh, made of? What does she think its virtues and its powers are? Uh, how does she think that the substance of that food relates to the substance of her body, indeed to other things in the world? And finally, what does taste mean to her? What, what languages, what concepts, what sensibilities does she have? to understand what she's tasting when she tastes that apple, what is its signal about the goodness, the nutritiousness, the possible risks and dangers of the food. Now it would be nice uh, to parse taste into its stable natural bits and its variable historical bits, but it's not that simple. Psychologists as well as common sense actors know how profoundly taste at a neural and experiential level is affected by one's expectations of taste and these are his, his thoroughly historical matters. So this is a scene which has got natural bits but it's got historicity all the way through. So it's a good image. It wasn't easy finding an image like that. It's a good image to consider. Now I want to start by uh, describing some features of a taste culture that marked the early modern period, 17th, 18th century. Uh, and first, uh, there is, as it were, a, an ontological or cosmological aspect. The relations between what people believe about their food and their understanding of the basic nature of matter. Uh, secondly, there 
there's an epistemological aspect uh, thought about the sensory experiences of taste and of digestion and its status as a source of knowledge uh, about what makes up the alimentary portion of the world. And third, there are features relating the ontology and the epistemology of aliment to practical medical advice into what have been called the practices of the self. What are the edibles in the saying, the well-known saying, you are what you eat? Who is this you? How does this you know about these edibles and what they do in you and to you? So it, it, that little scene of the girl eating the apple uh, is, as it were, a window onto a series of questions as big in scope as you can imagine. So let's start with a, uh, a basic vocabulary used from antiquity through the early modern period for describing the nature of aliments. Here's some examples. Onions are hot and dry. Black pepper is the same, but more so. Melons are cold and moist. Figs are hot and moist. Beef is cold and dry, although if you roast the beef, you make it moister, and if you bake it, you make it drier. It was often said that all wines are hot, but different sorts of wines differed in their qualities, and they could change fundamentally as they age. So it was widely said that wines got hotter as they got older. Now, this vocabulary is Galenic vocabulary. It comes from the Roman physician Galen in the second century AD. It's vocabulary that was used stably from Latin antiquity, at least through the 17th century, and in the vernacular, one could say, into the 19th century and, and beyond. It was a vocabulary that was used to describe the edible world and to prescribe what and how people should consume. It refers to the four basic qualities of things in the world, all things, qualities possessed in pairs by the four elements in the Aristotelian Platonic system, earth, air, fire, and water, and in the body by the four humors, which were blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. But at the same time, and this is important to note, hotness, coldness, moistness, and dryness are qualities that are apprehended by the senses. By the sense of touch, you can touch all these things, but also by the sense uh, of uh, taste. And for Aristotelians, the senses of touch, taste, and smell were constitutively related. What can be tasted is always something that can be touched. Now here you have to understand the taste and smell were understood to be contact senses. The, the, uh, the sense thing or an emanation of the sense thing had to be in contact with the senses organ in order to be experienced, unlike sight and unlike hearing, which were senses that could uh, uh, take in the world at a, at a, uh, a, a distance. Contact senses, touch, taste, and smell, might be necessary, even in some cases reliable senses, but they're almost always regarded as low and crude from antiquity to the present. In the 18th century, for example, Condillac began a survey of the senses with smell. He said, because of all the senses, it is the one which appears to contribute least to the cognitions of the human mind. Taste wasn't much better, but it affects its possessors more powerfully than smell. Kant believed something uh, pretty much the same. Vision has been pervasively used as a model for proper knowledge, gustation only in specific views of experiential affect-laden knowing. The philosopher of science Michael Polanyi in the 1950s repeatedly referred to scientific judgment as connoisseurship, and he gestured parallels between the skills of the scientist and those of the wine taster. But apart from the views of Thomas Kuhn, this sort of anti-rationalist picture of scientific knowing has not proved popular. The vocabulary of qualities didn't, of course, exhaust the language that past people used to describe a taste of things. Aristotle's On the Soul divided the species of flavor into the opposing categories of sweet and bitter. The former included the succulent, we don't know what that is, and the latter, the salty, we do. Somewhere in between for Aristotle came the pungent, the harsh, the astringent, and the acid. These pretty well exhaust the varieties of flavor, Aristotle said, and he 
concluded that there was neither the need for nor the possibility of a very rich and extensive vocabulary of tastes and smells. Even after the attempted revolution in the language and epistemology of olfaction and gustation in the late 17th century, John Locke, who led that revolution, wrote that the varieties of smells, which are as many almost, if not more than species of bodies in the world, so in other words, there is a rich and complex experience of smell. Most of them, however, he said, lack names. They lack descriptive uh, predicates. Sweet and stinking commonly serve our turn for these ideas, which in effect is little more than to call them pleasing or displeasing, nor are the different tastes that by our palates we receive ideas of much better provided with names. Sweet, bitter, sour, harsh, and salt are almost all the epithets we have to denominate that numberless variety of relishes, etc., etc. So everyone noticed, knew that the experience of taste and smell could be complex, but our language wasn't up to it. And most people, for reasons we'll consider, didn't think that our language should make much of an effort of being up to it. Now Locke was right about that. Early modern repertoires for describing the smells and tastes of food weren't very extensive, nor were they very discriminating, nor did they try to be. Little had changed from antiquity. Apart from the Galenic terminology, uh, common early modern vernacular terms for describing the tastes of foods and drinks were limited. Writing in the Anatomy of Plants in 1675, Nehemiah Grew worked up eight simple tastes, each illustrated by a botanical type, uh, paradigm. So you want to know what bitter is for Nehemiah Grew, here's rhubarb. Uh, but he also gave names to many more compound tastes, as many as 1,800. But Grew's scheme never caught on, and attempts to expand the list of basic taste categories, including those by von Haller and Linnaeus in the 18th century, never got a grip on other scientific or vernacular usages. A 17th century attempt to describe wine tastes named just four, sweet, acute, austere, and mild. Now for a substance that was recognized to have very complex flavors and odors, that's it. In principle, all the basic taste terms like acid and sweet were understood to derive from the four Aristotelian qualities of things. So for example, sweet was sometimes said to be hot and moist. But for present purposes, it's, it's important to note that these qualities were themselves sensory qualities. Hot, cold, moist, and dry are all qualities of things that are sensible as such by the related contact senses of touch and taste. Now the tongue is a, is a tasting organ, but it's also a tactile organ at the same time. Now it's a common saying, it goes back as far as you like, you are what you eat. And you can find versions of it uh, practically everywhere. With the vocabulary of Galenic medicine bound your nature to aliment and to the experiences of taste and digestion in a profound way. Just as food and drink could be described in terms of their possession of the four qualities, so too were the humors which produced human temperaments, human temperaments, complexions, or constitutions. The melancholic was someone in, who, in, which, in, in whom the humor of black bile dominated and thus tended to temperamental coldness and dryness. Scholars are notoriously melancholic, cold and dry, and of course you all get cold and dry as you get uh, older. And so on for people of bilious temperaments, phlegmatic or sanguinary temperaments. You could actually see these temperaments because this is the 18th century scheme, physiognomical scheme of Lavater. You have the phlegmatic man at the top left and the scholarly melancholic man at the bottom right. So these humors are actually visible through illusion, through uh, showing the predominance of one or other humor. So these are ways of describing, so just as the categories of hot, cold, moist, dry are way of ways of describing types of people, so too are sweet, acid, salty, and dry. It's an interesting observation, but it makes sense through the humoral scheme of things. Now there are two broad principles regulating medical and lay practical advice about diet in this system. First of all, if you were a person in normal health, you should consume foods that on the whole matched or agreed with your temperament. 
So for example, if you were melancholic like me, tending to cold and dry, and in normal health, then the diet that agrees with me is a diet of foods that tend towards the cold and dry, and so on and so forth. And the term of art that was used, now we don't think of it as a term of art to describe this matching, was agreement. So that when we say something agrees with us, it's an empty linguistic shell of a cosmological and psychological scheme in, in the Galenic system. So for example, in the late 16th century, the Venetian diet writer Luigi Cornaro, who by the way Nietzsche hated because he was ascetic, said that you ought only to eat and drink such things as agree with the stomach. And that agreement followed the contours of temperament. If you were cold and dry, you should eat foods that tended toward the cold and dry and so on and, and so forth. However, if you were uh, ill, an illness understood as an imbalance of one or the other humor, and therefore an imbalance of the qualities. So melancholic people, states of disease tend towards the extreme of coldness and dryness. Then you should eat foods that corrected for your momentary imbalance. So that you should uh, eat foods that were, whose qualities were in the opposite uh, direction. Now, of course, we're talking now about cuisine. And the arts and sciences of cooking were medically framed and medically understood. Tastes that went together and that were commended for their harmony and pleasantness were commonly combinations of aliment whose qualities balanced or corrected for, and again, the empty linguistic show is correct the seasoning, corrected for each other's qualities. For example, here's a classic one you can get at any Italian restaurant where the coldness and moistness of the melon is corrected by the dryness and the heat of the prosciutto or the parma hen. Here's another one much loved in, in England, uh, rhubarb corrected by ginger. So again, the whole, the whole understanding of cuisine in terms of the matching of foods has got a medical Galenic uh, framework. Cuisine and medicine, you're using the same language, uh, in other words. So these kinds of, of practices are ways of correcting foods whose qualities might tend towards overbalance the qualities in your own body and therefore within a dish, within a meal, within a day, within a seasonal diet, the exercise of Galenic medicine as the exercise of cuisine was to correct for and balance the qualities of foods. And you could know whether foods agreed with you first by the quality of taste because after all your tongue, your palate is made out of the same substance as the rest of your body. So pleasantness on the palate is a sign, an ontological sign, that the foods that you have put on your, your palate agree with, with you. And by the close observation of what foods were pleasant to your palate and what foods were well digested and what foods came out the other end in due form and order, you could, it was to say, become your own physician and you should be your own physician. So your experience of taste, your experience of digestion, your experience of, uh, of evacuation was the experience of what agreed with you and that was the basis on which was widely said you could and should be your own physician. Sometimes it was said that until the age of 30, until the age of 40, until the age of 50, every man was either a fool or a physician, meaning if you hadn't learned that much by that age, uh, then you were indeed a fool. But typically it could be expected that you would learn that much. You find that sort of language very strongly in Montaigne, who is of course extremely skeptical of the expertise of physicians. So coming to know whether something agreed with you or not, you could do this in a number of ways. One way you could do it was by reading the hundreds of books called dietaries, which would explain to you what qualities were possessed by what different items uh, of aliment. But the other way in which you could do this, as I've mentioned, was through the experience of taste. And here the, the Latin tag that expresses this powerfully and that bounces around through the early modern period and, and beyond is quod sapit nutri. If it tastes good, it's good for you. 
the, the, the saying has been a, attributed to a number of people, but it's a, probably like a lot of, of proverbs and epithems of folk saying uh, that pretty much everyone knew how to say. It was an article of medical common sense, at least in those sectors of society, that it could exercise significant elementary choice. Your taste reliably told you what the qualities of foods were and what was good and needful for you. And this was something that could be conceded even by um, uh, Cartesians like Nicholas Malebranche. He used just that example in the late 17th century. This is Malebranche, a man in fever, for example, who finds that wine is bitter and wine is also then harmful to him. The same man finds it pleasant tasting when he is in health, and wine is then good for him. So this experience, and you find exactly the same example in Montaigne. So when you go off wine, when wine doesn't taste good to you, that is a sign that you should not be taking, you should not be taking wine. And when wine tastes good to you again, that's a sign that wine should be taken, that it is healthful for you. And this is the connection in which it's useful to remember that taste once carried the general sense of testing or trying, which it now does only in the case of cooking. So you see a chef on television saying, taste, taste, taste in the sense of test, 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 just as the Seth says, says correct the seasoning. Now, quote sapit was one basis for the now seemingly perverse medical enthusiasm for sweet things. Though like many other exotic foods and spices, sugar had long been treated as a medicine and sold in apothecary shops. In 1620, an English physician announced that sugar agreeeth with all ages and all complexions, that's temperaments, uh, some historians claim that expert medical sentiment on this was changing by the beginning of the 17th century, but influential physicians insisted on the superior nutritiousness of sweet things well into the 18th century. And I give you William Cullen lecturing on Materia Medica in the 1760s. And he said that the agreeableness of taste was a wholly reliable guide to the nutritiousness of things. This is Cullen. In general, the more sweet substances are all nutritious, while those of an acrid, bitter, and nauseous nature are improper. Human bodies are most delicate, and the acrid, bitter, and disagreeable can never be admitted as elements. Now, Cullen had evidently heard criticism of Scott's notoriously sweet tooth, and he rejected it. Sugar is wonderful, he said. It doesn't rot the teeth, as some allege. And he said, the mischiefs of what is called in Scotland eating of sweeties are wrongly imputed to sugar, including uh, 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 sweet wines. So this was a common thing. Well into the 18th century, quote sap, but nutrient. In the 1670s, Malebranche, the Cartesian, defended the reliability of the senses, including gustation, as guides to medical prudence. How things tasted could be quite a good sign of their powers and effects, a suggestion that was also made by Robert Hooke and Nehemiah Grew. So the subjective experience of liking something was in another frame an index of that thing's real qualities and powers. That's to say, the aesthetic experience of liking, the subjective experience of liking, it gives epistemological grip to the experience of gustation and olfaction. Now this broad relationship between taste, quality, and consequence was folded into the intellectual structures of 18th century botany, materia medica, and physiology. The article on botany in the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, codified a common knowledge, glossing standard taste categories according to their bodily effects. The sensations of smell and taste give us some intimation of the nature and qualities of plants. An agreeable taste or smell is seldom accompanied with noxious qualities. And then lots and lots of people said that the taste of bitterness of botanical things, for example, was a reliable sign, perhaps divinely ordained, of the elements saying to you, don't eat me, I may be poisonous. And by the way, uh, therefore, the, the discussions from the middle of the 17th century and onward about the naturalness and healthfulness of tea and coffee was very much set against this sort of background because tea and coffee uh, were, were reckoned to be uh, notoriously bitter. And therefore, the, the connection is Sidney Mintz has argued between uh, tea and sugar, 
powering the Industrial Revolution, again, is understood in terms of a Galenic medical framework. 18th century philosophers debated the relationship between judgment and taste, and they debated the emerging metaphorical extension of palate taste to aesthetic taste. And doing that, they could call on a standard of taste which was grounded in both physiology and theology, and that held out the possibility of moral critique. So this is Thomas Reed, a Scottish common sense philosopher and essays on the intellectual powers of man. The taste of the palate may be accounted most just and perfect when we relish the things when we relish the things uh, that are fit for the nourishment of the body and are disgusted with things of a contrary nature. That sort of taste was the manifest intention of nature. And so for people like Reed had to account for the depravity of taste, which was the result of custom, which was the result of civilization, is one of the diseases of civilization that corrupted the natural taste by which we would eat things that tasted good, and those things, and only those things, would be good for us. So connoisseurship, the connoisseur who was appearing on the scene at around the time Reed is, is writing, if you wanted to be an ascetic, Presbyterian, uh, po-faced uh, critic, was one of the causes of corrupted taste. There's a debate between the connoisseur as a refined figure and the connoisseur as an example of depravity. Now there was a second sense of what it was for Alleman to agree. You could tell whether something didn't agree with you when it didn't go down well, when it didn't sit well in your stomach, and it didn't come out the other end. Why pay a doctor when you could tell by evidence signs what agreed with you? Now in practical dietetic terms, this understanding of agreement and its related ontological concept of taste meant that following your appetites might and often should be the right thing to do. Ascetics and people commending deference to professional medical expertise might differ, but the notion that if it tastes good, it's good for you circulated influentially throughout the Renaissance and early modern civil society. It was one of the problems that doctors had in taking all the joy out of life. The first rule of medicine inscribed on Apollo's temple at Delphi was know thyself. And in Galenic medical culture, you might do that effectively through the evidence abundantly and excessively offered by how foods tasted and by the experiences of digestion. In the early modern, taste and digestion were cosmological conditions with evident epistemological implications. So I summarize this bit of what I have to say. In the early modern culture of taste, a culture that remained amazingly stable since Roman antiquity, how things tasted had ontological grip. The taste of things testified to how things ultimately were. Taste also had epistemological implications in that taste-based knowledge might be regarded as secure. Maybe clumsy, but secure even if it lacked a discriminating language. And it had practical consequences since experiential knowledge of yourself and your food enabled you to constitute your own expertise and to prescribe your own regimen. So the question is, what happened? What happened when this culture of taste began to change and finally when it practically disappeared from official expertise about bodies and elements? At the very end of the 17th century, John Locke was one of several thinkers trying to come to terms with that, the, to the exotic taste of a pineapple. The pineapple was both a talisman of the unprecedentedly exotic and a typical sense object. This is a painting by John Rose around the 1670s of the Royal Gardener. No, it's not a painting by John Rose. It is John Rose, the royal gardener, presenting the first pineapple allegedly grown in England to King Charles II. Royal Society had intense interest in the cultivation of, of the pineapple through the middle of the 18th century. But to John Locke and other philosophers, the pineapple was a problem. Uh, Locke reckoned that the standard language we had to convey taste to others who had not consumed such a thing was, wasn't up to the task, though that objection, I think, should apply to much more common subjective experiences such as the taste of a pear. I mean, John Locke, when he wrote this, apparently had never tasted a pineapple. Everyone had tasted a pear. So you could say 
you pear like and everyone would know because everyone had the simple idea of a pear but if you said pineapple you couldn't do this in language because no one knew what a pineapple tasted like um, and the language wasn't up to it. We talk about how things taste but it's mostly only talk uh, and what we ascribe to words should be rightly ascribed to prior sensory experiences with the material objects of taste. And this is John Locke in the essay concerning human understanding. Basically, he, he said simple ideas are only to be got by those impressions, objects themselves make on our minds by the proper inlets appointed to each one. He that thinks otherwise, said White, let him try if any words can give him the taste of a pineapple and make him have the true idea of the relish of that celebrated delicious fruit. You can't do it. Okay, think about that, wine tasters. So now here we're on the classic ontological and epistemological terrain of the scientific revolution. The distinction between primary and secondary qualities. Traced first in Galileo's assayer and later found in writings by Descartes, Boyle, and systematically in John Locke himself. The subjective experiences of how things look, feel, sound, smell, and taste are not to be taken as reliable indications of how they are, of what they are as objects. So that Locke wrote that sensible qualities like the yellowness of the pineapple's flesh, the sharpness of its skin, the sweetness of its savor, and any other of its sensible forms are secondary qualities. They are, in truth, nothing in the pineapple itself. The powers to produce those sensations are in the pineapple, but they depend on the primary qualities of the size, shape, arrangement, and motion of its non-sensible parts. So what Locke is doing is taking away epistemological and ontological grip from the experiences of, of olfaction and uh, uh, augustation. Note here that the vocabulary traditionally used to describe the pineapple as foodstuff, including its position on the map of Galenic qualities, was so to speak, sorry for the fancy term, deontologized. And the knowledge that we may have of the pineapple as a smelled and tasted object now appears as an epistemological problem. The taste of a pineapple, you could say with some exaggeration, was perhaps one of the first truly modern philosophical problems. The epistemological problem of the pineapple was a move in philosophy, but it also marked a shift in the status of common experience in medicine and in the practices of the self. I've said something about how taste featured in medical thought and practice in the 17th century and before. You are what you eat, temperaments to the extent they were still invoked after Locke, could have no causal connection to the qualities of aliment. The cosmological connection had been formally broken. With some notable exceptions, uh, quote, sapit, nutrit, became a nonsensical thing to say in official scientific and medical culture. Briass Savarin said that in the 1820s in France, but he was a gourmand, not a doctor or uh, philosopher. Indigestion also lost, so to speak, its epistemological significance. And more generally, every cultural practice that depended upon taste and smell being reliable guides to what the world was ultimately like was being set free from its ontological and epistemological moorings. Now if taste had lost sometime around the 17th, 18th century, if taste had lost its status as a reliable philosophical guide, as an index to what the world was ultimately like, that didn't mean it had become worthless, nor could it or any of the other senses be regarded as worthless in a culture that understood the senses as divine gifts. The same senses that were no longer much good in telling us about the ultimate realities of the world might remain valuable in getting us around the world on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Foucault and others have written about the pre-classical world of signatures, a world in which there were telling and God-given resemblances between the appearances of things, their natures, and their powers. Those resemblances operated on an elementary level. Consider how this worked for wines in the 16th and 17th century. Wines that resembled blood were ascribed some of its powers, so tent or tinto, probably as we would say Rioja, 
is, it was said in the 17th century, a gross nutritive wine and is very quickly concocted into blood. This is analogical reasoning. Wines that were light in color and light in texture were often said to have medical consequences flowing from those sensible qualities. So for example, Rhenish wine or hock is wholesome, diuretic, and serviceable in the stone and gravel. Everyone had the stone in the early modern period. While tart and sharp wines cause obstruction. So wines that appeared light in color and texture could even be said to dissolve gravel and the stone. This is again is analogical reasoning. Now Foucault said that the cosmology of resemblances and signatures disappeared by the early 17th century, replaced by mechanical quality less cosmos, the world of representation. True, in the atra mechanical medical and physiological practices deriving from the natural philosophies of Boyle, Descartes, and Newton, in other words, the attempt to make the mechanical philosophy of nature into a medical system, the causes of taste and smell were ultimately ascribed to the effect on the bodily substance of particles that were variously sized, shaped, configured, and moved. But again, it's not quite that tidy. Newtonian and Cartesian medical writers of the late 17th and early 18th centuries could stick with the old inferential patterns, the Galenic patterns, or they might use the newer mechanical vocabularies to justify traditional inferences from the sensory appearances of aliment to their qualities and powers. And more commonly, and this is the typical taste in history, they work with a pastiche of the old Galenic and analogical modes of reasoning and the new mechanical modes uh, of reasoning. In the early 18th century, for example, the Newtonian physician John Arbuthnot, going through a standard list of elements and their virtues, occasionally endorsed analogical reasoning from the taste of things to reliable knowledge of their physiological powers. This is for a Newtonian. Even while tracing the effects of foods to their cor corpuscular makeup, Apples, Arbuthnot said, were in general cooling and gently laxative. And he noted that their qualities may be easily known by their taste. Now, this is not the kind of thing that a Newtonian should be saying. He said it. Things give sensory signals of what they were likely to do when, when eaten. The vocabulary linking taste to powers didn't disappear suddenly, nor was it likely to do when you reflect on the range of expert and lay practices in which such inferences were institutionalized. In other words, they were part of the processes of getting around on a quotidian basis. It's not easy to get rid of the schemes that underlie those practices. Reference to taste that invoked qualities and temperaments continued into the 19th century and beyond, especially in popular medical genres, though they began to fall away from academic writings from the late 17th and early 18th uh, century. The so-called chemical revolution of the late 18th and early 19th century, for all practical purposes, shattered any remaining substantial links between the experiences of taste and knowledge of the real properties and effects of foods. The physiological writings of the English chemist William Prout divided the properties of aliment, as he called them, the three staminal or root principles, into the saccharine, sweetness, the oily, a category which for him included alcohol, and the albuminous, or we would tend to say protonaceous. And while you can see in principle how at least the sweet might map onto the sensation of taste. In fact, Prout's work in the 1830s made absolutely no reference to gustation. Nor did the slightly later and more influential work of the German chemist Justus von Liebig, dividing the nutritious constituents of aliment into proteins, starches, and fats. Liebig knew what these constituents were chemically, and he knew what effects they had on the human body, but the experiences of taste were no longer a significant part of the story. You couldn't taste these things. You had to go through the chemist's laboratory in order to know these things as the constituents of our element. By the late 19th and early 20th century, the fast developing disciplines eventually to become known as nutrition science had effectively removed taste from the resources people possessed to know what their element was made of and when ingested, what effects it would have on them. 
Here's a modern artifact. It's a nutrition facts label. This one comes from the United States, but there are uh, equivalents in the UK and in many other European countries. You cannot taste the listed constituents on this con interesting conjuncture of nutrition science and state uh, authority. You cannot taste saturated and trans fats, cholesterol, and even though you say you might be able to taste sodium uh, as salty, we all know that through the ingenuity of, of organic chemists, both the experiences of fattiness and the experience of saltiness can be produced by substances other than sodium or, 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 uh, or lipids. So you don't know these things in the modern nutritional science scheme of things through uh, uh, taste. Uh, you think you know that sweet things have sugar, but then there are artificial sweeteners and so on, and for example, uh, uh, of salty things. You know them, and they have become to a large extent part of our vernacular, whereas when people say, I have to watch my sodium or I have to watch my cholesterol, but we know these things by courtesy. They have to transit the expert chemist's laboratory and other to become part of our vernacular. So it's not an opposition between a modern vernacular, it's that part of our modern vernacular is now generated in the chemist's uh, laboratory. Now what about the place of connoisseurship in this story? The character of the connoisseur came fully into being in the 18th century together with the English importation of the French term. And I want to argue, but I couldn't possibly establish the claim here, that the full flowering of the vocabulary of elementary connoisseurship is a 20th century phenomenon. If that's so, there's some apparent counter evidence to consider. Pliny the Elder, Roman antiquity, mentioned a freed slave in the court of Emperor Claudius who could reliably distinguish wines of different geographical origins, detect which of them were flawed, and predict which would suit the emperor's palate. The emerging culture of refinement and sensibility in the 18th century edgily approved the extension of the idea of a taste for aliment to a taste for beautiful art. For some, there was metaphorical for others, it testified to capacities genuinely shared between the two forms uh, of taste. In 1712, and this is an example of, uh, of, of approving of the extension, jo Joseph Addison of The Spectator wrote about taste and how it might be improved. I know a person who possessed uh, gustatory abilities in so great a perfection that after having tasted ten different kinds of tea, he would distinguish without seeing the color of it the particular sort which was offered him. These are not uncommon stories, even in Roman antiquity. They certainly circulate in the 18th century. Now in Don Quixote, Cervantes told a story which was importantly repeated in the mid-18th century in David Hume's great essay of a standard of, of taste. And this is the story that Hume is telling, which he lifts from, uh, from Don uh, Quixote. It's a story about Sancho Panza saying that he comes from a family of uh, celebrated wine tasters, and the story is that some of, of Sancho's kins went to a village and there's a hogshead of wine, and you're so good, they say, the villagers say to the, to the Ponzas, tell us whether this wine is good or not. The relatives take a taste of the wine. One says, mm, pretty good, but I detect a note of leather. Other one tastes it and says, pretty good, but I detest, uh, detect a note of iron. And the villagers laugh at them, just like they laugh at the guava and bell pepper people that include Barry and me for using such predicates. But the joke, Sancho Ponce and David Human say, uh, was on the villagers because when the hogshead was drained, they found at the bottom of the hogshead a leathern key. So a little bit of the taste of leather, a little bit of the taste of art. But note this story is not about guava and bell paper as flavor components. It's about flaws in the taste of wine. Wine ought not to taste of iron, ought not to taste uh, of, uh, of leather. So the ability of people to make these discriminations, though the language was lacking, is not a problem. It is widely uh, acknowledged uh, over a very long period of time by very many people. It becomes rather more important as the culture of connoisseurship develops in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, this is Brias Savarin, 
applauding the gourmands of Rome, who were able to distinguish the flavors of fish taken from above and below the bridge. Have we not seen in our own time the, that gourmands can distinguish the flavor of the thigh on which the partridge lies down from the other? Are we not surrounded by gourmets? And I love this example comparing the uh, accuracy of judgment with the accuracy of scientific knowledge. Are we not surrounded by gourmets who can tell the latitude in which any wine ripened as surely as one of Bio's or Arago's disciples can foretell an eclipse? And in um, 1863, an English connoisseur who professed himself unable to make the, such discriminations wrote that the palate, like the eye, the ear, or touch, acquires by practice various degrees of sensitiveness that would be incredible were it not a well-ascertained fact. It is related that of the Roman epicures in the time of Lucullus, that they could decide whether an oyster was from the Lucrine Lake or from Natolia. The Victorian English were notably insistent on the pertinence of such discriminations. A connoisseur in one of Trollope's novels urged the importance of knowing the tastiest bit of a salmon. Was it from the neck or the middle? A crude palate was the exact equivalent of an untrained eye or an immoral character. Not to distinguish, this is a Trollope character, not to distinguish a 51 wine from a 58 is to look at an arm or leg on the canvas and to care nothing whether it is in drawing, in perspective, or out of drawing. Not to know the finest beefsteak from other beefsteaks is to say that every woman is the same to you. See, so getting connoisseurship is a form of knowing, yes. It's, it has epistemological significance and it also has moral significance in a culture of refinement. Discriminatory, discriminatory taste skills had long had an important place in court and polite societies and by the 18th century a reflective polite culture of connoisseurship valued gustatory discrimination even if many writers continued to have their doubts about its legitimacy as in a uh, uh, an aesthetic capacity on a par with a taste for poetry or painting. How could it have happened, Kant asked, that modern languages have designated the aesthetic faculty of judging with an expression gustus, sapor, that merely refers to a certain sense organ, the inside of the mouth, and to its discrimination as well as choice of enjoyable things. The feeling of an organ through a particular sense has been able to furnish the name for an ideal feeling, the feeling namely of a sensible, universally valid choice in general. So some approve that transference of palate taste to higher aesthetic taste. Others insisted on a firm distinction between palate judgment and painting judgment. But the development of elementary connoisseurship is a noteworthy moment in the history of taste. Uh, and it now has a body of solid scholarship about it, but some historical qualifications have to be made. Almost everything about gustatory discrimination before the late 18th century, almost everything about the talk about gustatory discrimination before the late 18th century, concerned the capacity to discern soundness and authenticity, especially in the case of wines, there was a series of practical concerns addressed through taste and smell. Was the wine flawed? Was it in good condition? Was it adulterated? Was it the wine that it was said to be? There's no doubt that certain consumers were also concerned with the taste of quality and that quality judgments about different sorts of aliment, including wines, circulated in past cultures. They did. But once those questions were addressed, there was little or no concern with parsing gustatory and olfactory experiences, reflecting on the range of those experiences, analyzing those experiences, assigning to those experiences descriptive predicates, and then using those analytic descriptions to do something in the culture that was neither ontological nor medical. The vocabularies of, of connoisseurship 
from the 18th century filled part of the cultural space once occupied by the sensibilities and categories of Aristotelian natural philosophy and Galenic dietetic medicine. So the decline of both scholasticism and Galenic, Galenic medicine must have something to do with the changing languages and practices of taste. And here the history of taste intersects the history of epistemology. Sometime in the late 17th and 18th centuries, the institutionalization of the distinction between primary and secondary qualities disrupted traditional networks connecting taste experiences, knowledge, personal identity, and practical action. Learned society came to regard taste and smell as less and less capable of serving as a probe into what the world was like and what its ingestible portions did for you and to you. For guidance in such things, you now had to turn to external expertise. You could no longer taste reality or experience its constitution through digestion. Taste experiences and judgments were filed away in the drawer labeled subjective, carrying the epistemic health warning that there's little to be coherently said about them or done with them. But paradoxically, through the 19th century and into the 20th century, we've actually wound up saying not less and less about taste, but more and more. The removal of taste experiences from the practices of producing reliable knowledge of the world and of our bodies made taste a scientific and philosophical orphan. But at the same time, it made taste a suitable case for connoisseurship. Our modern connoisseurs display their ability to analyze, distinguish between, and assign descriptive predicates to each of the thousands of wine flavor and odor components, and to produce seemingly precise quantitative measures of how good good wines taste. The vocabulary of taste has accordingly moved from the spare to the ornate. From the limited vocabulary of wine tastes used in the 17th century, we now have wines tasting like wet stones, roasted lilacs, raw walnuts, savory fennel seed, tomato skins, burly tobacco, and even my favorite, fresh roadkill. <laughs> how would you know? There are people who know how to make those distinctions, and there are those who do not. We no longer use taste to know the qualities and powers of aliment, to sort the edible world into the bits that are good for you and those that are not. For those purposes, we have the language, concepts, skills, and institutions of technical experts. What's left to lay society is the use of these, of these distinctions to sort the species of people, those that have taste and those that have not. And here's the image. <laughs> I don't know if you can read, this is the famous James Thurber cartoon from The New Yorker in 1937. The host hoists his glass and says, it's a naive domestic burgundy without any breeding, but I think you'll be amused by its presumption. <laughs> Distinctions between people. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. We have time for a few questions. Crafts as well as 
um, finding things, you know, um, even metal crafts and all sorts of crafts. Uh, yeah, and, and I'm, you know, I've caught the eye again. Uh, like, uh, soap, soap makers and yeah, I think that's a very valuable suggestion. You're absolutely right. The only gesture I made to that was uh, the, the, the person who was a great connoisseur who can tell the difference in authenticity of mine for the court of uh, Emperor Claudius as a slave. The genre that includes uh, mysteries, the mystery of the Vintners, for example, uh, is a very important source of that ability to, to to know things through the, uh, the, the contact senses, but including the senses. You're absolutely right about it. It should be included. It tends to be rather, perhaps you'll correct me, rather invisible from the point of view of the scientific and, and philosophical. But that's no reason to, to ignore that at, at all. Um, in other words, and, and I may not have been clear about that. On the one hand, we have the poverty of language. But on the other hand, we have the, the admitted ability of certain people, perhaps through practice, perhaps through national, uh, natural gifts, to make very fine and, and consequential dis distinctions. However, um, the people who, from antiquity through the Renaissance and early modern, were able, until the period of culture of refinement, able to make those distinctions, are not highly valued people. So I think it's an extremely interesting and useful suggestion. Um, thanks, Lee. Um, I was really struck by thinking about the precept that if it tastes good, that it's just going to be good for you. Um, um, parallels between that and one play is about pregnancy, the one who should or shouldn't be or who you know, want to be. And thinking about the way that expertise in that play is still very contested. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about the resignation. It, it's a very interesting example. I mean, I think, again, to describe medical expertise, say the face-to-face -face domain, you go to doctor's surgery, what happens is to talk about prestige. So on the one hand, um, we were, I think we rather what I unkindly call the Calvinist tendency to think that things that taste good must be bad for us. Which I think has got a genealogical relationship to, to why medicine should be bitter. In other words, that things that taste good can't possibly uh, be good for us as a kind of, you know, it's a doppelganger to the idea that things that are powerful, perhaps dangerous, perhaps curative, are signaled that by their unpleasant or, or bitter taste. But what happens, I think, in many doctors' surgeries, is uh, you, you get more. I look at how many units of alcohol I take. So I don't drink alcohol, I drink wine. I don't drink units, I drink glasses. And uh, some doctors will say, shake their heads and say, you're a hopeless case. Others will say, well, if you enjoy it, it must be good for you. And I quote in my most recent uh, GP. So I think that's the kind of pastiche in which we now live. Now, when you come to the well-known cases of the disturbance of taste judgment, cider disease, or pregnancy, which is not a disease, if you treat it as such. Uh, again, I think you get a very highly loaded pastiche. So, on the one hand, um, uh, you're sick, you must have this bitter tasting medicine. On the other hand, you're sick, and I, I know this for myself. The only time that I actually like that is when I'm sick. And so it's kind of a lay culture. My grandmother would have this kind of thing. If, if there's something you want, this is the world of Montaigne. If, if, you, if you want something when you're sick, it's probably good for you. If you don't want it when you're sick, it's probably bad for you. And I think we do live in a passage, but you cannot find these in official medical texts. And I think the best way of describing the condition in which we now live is a, a world in which these Galenic quotes have a nutrient sensibilities have been hollowed out from official medicine, which is not to say they've been drained from our, our daily practices. Could you say that just a little 
question to you. The story about original sin, wrong kind of wrong kind of food, and by the way, it only became an apple in the history of art. Um, but the wrong kind of, of food, I don't recall it in Genesis there's any language it takes, but what does happen with original sin when Adam and Eve are cast on is they now have to do things that they didn't have to do before. One thing they had to do was agriculture, the sweat of that ground. So they had to grow food. Another thing they had to do was cook. So in other words, we are to understand, and there's tremendous debate on this through the medieval period, the Renaissance, and the early modern. What is the primitive diet of, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Uh, one popular opinion was that they were fruitarians, and they were, it was not slow food, it was raw food. So the cooking, again, is a condition of original sin. That's a mark of the depravity of human beings. And that continues with the flood. The earth becomes less fertile, and our tastes become depraved, and we need now sauces and spices. And so you get pre Calvin Calvinism as a story about why is the relish, I think this led to with your question, why does the relish for spicy, especially, and compounded and elaborately prepared foods is a bad thing morally? So, this is one of the great debates about whether. We are made for pleasure, we're made for pain. Um, but it, it does really importantly center it on spices and also on the elaborateness or the compounding of foods and from the late Middle Ages. Yeah, the answer is it has a contested but deeply moral dimension. Yeah, I was going to say something about uh, what Dr. Lee said about the Food. Um, actually, I was really going to say what about hippocratic aphorisms. Um, because the hippocratic aphorisms, um, which were quite widely disseminated by the 18th century, are full of all these little things that your grandmother said. Yes. It's quite remarkable how they can make a little bit of what friends as good. is a very um, common thing. The other thing about the morality, of course, is the morality of vegetarianism and food, and the idea of pure foods and raw foods being considered the apogee of moral foods in the 19th century. But then you contrast that with the fact that raw foods were considered to be undressed foods in earlier periods, and therefore not really sophisticated, civilized foods. So it's very important. Yeah, no, what can I say? Anyway, agreed. But the, the, the constant strain of, um, of contest, which is medical, uh, ideological, and moral, and, and, and sometimes, uh, frankly, political, as in debates of report and clarity through the 18th century in this country, um, are arguments about what the natural taste of humankind is. What the God-given taste of humankind is, how original sin has affected it, how certain kinds of, of social practices have affected it, whether uh, our, our liking for things as a result of the corruption of taste by the civilizing process, or whether our liking for things as a reliable God to their goodness for us. And this is the two poles of that in terms of the practical morality or the pain and pleasure principle for life. So there, there we draw the theorized old part to an end. And we thank you very much, Stephen, for the talk. It was rich, satisfying, balanced, all the things we would expect in the, the, the title. Not um, a fresh road kill. <laughs> not a fresh road kill, but I'm hoping that some people will maybe find that in what comes next. For those of you who have signed, uh, signed up to go to the tasting, the tasting is across the hall in the Macmillan Hall, just, just straight across from you. 
And if you would go in and take a seat and we will begin that within five or ten minutes. But before that, will you join me in thanking the Stephen Chairman very much?